All right. So let me go to the handy dandy and y'all should be able to see my screen here in just a second. Let me get through with everything. All right, y'all should see my PowerPoint come up right about now. So hopefully somebody give me a thumbs up that you can see the PowerPoint or say it, we see it or something in the chat. Uh, okay, I can there see we it. Go. All right, so good. let's go ahead and I will go through and hit the hotspots. And all I need y'all to do is write down the hotspots in your notebook. On some of the things I will explain a little bit because there is usually confusion on the things that I think are confusing to students over the last few years. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, statistics, uppercase statistics. And of course, I'm not going to have you write all that. So what I'm going to do is turn on my handy dandy. And I knew I was going to Sometimes I don't use the slides because they're too, too, uh, too wordy. I like to talk too much. I kind of like some people like to hear themselves talk. I got a little whiteboard. Maybe it'll make it easier on y'all. Uppercase statistics. Oh, this ain't going to work. Uppercase statistics. And remember, the uppercase means that basically this is collecting, managing, calculating, and interpreting data. That's basically what uppercase statistics is. Okay. Now remember, uppercase that you've got to, and I'm gonna put a I'm gonna make that a big I can't I wonder if I can write on the side of these. I'm gonna have to get uppercase statistics. Hold on just a minute. And I'm going to I've got stuff. Okay, you can't see that. There we go. I'm doing things a little bit different today because I'm using the slides. So you're going to have to give me a second to get all, get everything situated. Okay, so, so uppercase statistics is managing, calculating, and interpreting data. Lowercase statistics, and I'm going to go ahead and give you that one. Lowercase statistic is parameters slash variables used with the sample. Okay, and so sample, remember lowercase statistic goes with lowercase sample. Whereas parameter, let me go ahead and give you this one also. Parameter Hold on a second. Sorry. Lowercase parameter is parameters. slash variables 
used with the population. And I like to get these five definitions out of the way first. Population is always going to be what, the big or the small group? Anybody know? You don't have to say that. You can say it in the, the big group, exactly. So if I wanted to survey all Tri-County Tech students, that would mean the Pendleton campus, the Easley campus, the Sandy Springs campus, the Oconee campus, and the Anderson campus. But I can use a sample. A sample would be the Anderson campus because the Anderson campus is smaller. Now your goal of statistics and probability is to use the sample to predict the population because of two things which are most important to us as humans. What are those two things? Type them in. Does anybody know this had me before? What are the two most important things in our world? And don't say your girlfriend or your boyfriend because that's a bunch of bull crap. All right. What are two things that are most, especially in the career world, what are two things that are most important to us? Anybody know? Okay, I'll mark you, Mr. Hall. I'm going to take roll again after cl uh, when class is over. Um, anybody know? Time and moolah. Time and money. Time and money. What does that got to do with this? Well, when you're in a career field, when you're in your career and you are asked to do something that predicts the population, are you going to go out and ask every single person in the population? Or are you going to use the sample to predict the population? You're going to use the sample to predict the population. And that is your goal, especially right now. What's going on right now? The pandemic. I mean, if you wanted a statistical example of the real world, that's what we're doing right now. It's a pandemic. All right. The pandemic, if you notice, they did use the statistical models. Now, a lot of people say, yeah, they've been wrong the whole time. The reason they've been wrong is because the numbers that they were using were the numbers given to them by who? China. Was China being very truthful? Hail to the no. Okay, and we won't, we won't go into that right now, but there's a reason that China wasn't being very... But the reason that the numbers were skewed was because we were taking the numbers from China and putting them with the numbers from legitimate countries like Italy and France and all these other countries that were reporting truthful and our numbers were getting skewed. Okay, so anyway, big the big guy is the population. The little guy is the what? Sample. And your goal in probability of statistics is for the sample to predict the population. That, that's the whole gist of probability of statistics. <coughs> now, your statistics with lowercase s are always going to be regular alphabetic letters. Has anybody had probability before? Can you tell me what the letters are with the parameter? Anybody? Just type it in if you know. What kind of letters are they? Dang old Greek letters. I'll give you two examples for the regular letters x bar and s that's your mean and your standard deviation of the sample mu and sigma are your mean and standard deviation for the population is that a test question oh yeah is that a standardized test question oh yeah so you better make sure you read the question correctly because what they'll do is they'll give you five numbers and they'll say, this is the population. 
what does the population mean? And then they'll give you two answers. They'll give you X bar is equal to blah, 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 and mu is equal to blah, blah, blah. And if you pick X bar, it's wrong because they're asking for the population. Population means mu. It's also helpful when you walk into a meeting and they're talking about the mean and the X bar, I mean mean in regards to X bar and mu, and you know when you walk into the meeting that X bar is the sample mean and mu is the population mean, so you don't ask a stupid question and advertise to the rest of the room that you're stupid, okay? So that's why you need to know the difference between a sample statistic, and you need to write that, you can write that down in red right above it. Sample statistic, remember the S, or a population parameter. I even got another one. They had them dang old Walgreens. Dang old 50% off. Dang old about two of them. I don't know if I'm going to like them or not. Do y'all like the, do you like these better or the Sharpies? Just put it in the, put it in the thing. If you like these or the Sharpies, if you don't put anything, that means you don't really care. So, all right. So that takes care of the first couple of slides. You like the ink? I don't mind. Okay. But evidently, it doesn't really matter. I like the paper because I think it shows up better. But this is better when you don't. You ought to see. I got a stack of paper. I got a stack of paper teaching over the last. When did we start this? Like two or three months ago? A couple of months ago? I got a stack of papers that thick right over here that I got to throw away. They can all kill the trees. All right. So here we go. That's that page right there. Oh my, look at there. Population, sample, individual. Okay, I've already went over that, so you don't need that. That you might want to put a Tri-County Technical College, Anderson Campus, and then U. Or Tri-County Technical College, Pendleton Campus, U. That would be population, sample, individual. That is a test question also. Uh, any standardized test, any uh, employer test, they want to know if you know the difference between a population and a sample. Write this down. This is a, this is a test question. It's also a standardized test question. You already know what parameter is. A parameter is a variable or a parameter used in a population. I'm sorry, a variable used in a population. Uh, descriptive statistics consistent of organizing and summarizing data, descriptive of blah, 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 blah. Put test grades. Descriptive statistics would be your test grades. Inferential statistics use methods that take results from a sample, extends them to the population, and measures the reliability of the result. This is when you start predicting. Inferential is in chapters 9 and 10, okay, where you actually take statistics and you predict that the next piece of candy that comes out of that M&M pack is going to be a green one or an orange one or whatever. You predict that uh, in... Uh, I got a good example. I got a good example for y'all if I can pull it up right quick. Hold on. See if I can find it. YouTube. I know I'm going to show y'all a video and somebody's going to complain that I'm showing y'all a video. Yeah, uh, yes, yeah, so I want to let you know that Hubert was showing videos in class this morning. Oh, there's always one. I'm 
I don't know if I even got it on here. New deputy chart. I don't know if it's even on here or not. No, mm, uh, I'd have to find it. Well, anyway, there's a new deputy that shows up, and the new deputy takes the statistics from the from the uh, last year or last four or five years and predicts that there's going to be a wife beating. Um, and just as soon as he predicts it, a phone call comes in and says that uh, some man beat his wife in Mayberry. Okay, what is that? Is that descriptive statistics or is that inferential statistics? That would be inferential because the deputy made a prediction. Okay, so you need to write that down. When you do your uh, when you do your test grades, are you predicting anything? No. A lot of people say, well, you're predicting what grade you're going to get. No, you're not. You're not predicting anything because your grade is a 78. You got to see there is there isn't there isn't any prediction there. Okay, it's basically concrete. For inferential is you use that information to predict something. So make sure you make that distinction. Very important words right there. And of course, your lowercase statistics and your lowercase parameters right there. And you already got that. And this is an example of parameter versus statistic. I've already given you an example. So test grades versus and you usually use inferential in the real world. Think of DUI. Uh, how many DUIs will South Carolina have next year? And you pull that information from DOT or wherever they have probably DOT from, you know, conviction of DUIs. And uh, you use that information for the last five years to predict next year. If I skip stuff, that means it's just stuff that I, I, I go through and I streamline this. I grab what's important and what will be on the test. That's what I do, and I give it to you. Write this down. Qualitative versus quantitative. And this, this, These are test questions and standardized test questions, so make sure you write that down. Qualitative data. Blondes, brunettes, redheads. Somebody put in the discussion, what is blondes, brunettes, and redhead? What is that? Tell me what that is. Blondes, brunettes, and redheads. What is that? It's qualitative data. And somebody said colors, good. Hair colors, good. But why is it qualitative? They're qualitative because are these classes or are they categories? Qualitative data is categorical. Write that down. Categorical. Don't ask me to spell it. I ain't no daggum English teacher. But I believe it would be category and then I C A L. Okay, categorical. Characteristic. Yes, sir. I mean, sorry. Yes, ma'am. You are correct. All of those answers are correct. You could change blonde, brunettes, and redheads to brown eyed. Blue-eyed, green-eyed. Anybody know how many people have green eyes? I mean, true green eyes. I'm not talking about hazel brown. That's not green. Does anybody know how many people in the population of the world has green eyes? Anybody want to tell me what percent? Dang, oh, I looked it up. No guesses? Almost, Mr. Sprouse. Dos, 2%, unless something has changed, 2% of the population has green eyes. And I'm not talking about 
Oh, they're almost green. I'm talking about green, green. And of course, the most attractive people have brown eyes. So I guess the ones in the middle would be blue. So those are categories. Versus, and some of you guys know what this is. What about, what does boxing, wrestling, I didn't say wrestling, I said wrestling. I don't know how to do the IMG with an L. I always, I hope I got that right, I don't know. Some you drop, some you, I don't know if you drop, did I drop the E here? I think I dropped the e. Wrestling and I'm just going to say mixed martial arts. What do those three have in common? Somebody that, so thank you. Well, if you're a boxer, I was in, I was in, uh, I took Taekwondo. I'm just going to put karate because I don't, I don't know how to spell it. Karate, MMA, wrestling. What do those all have in common? Anybody want to take a guess? Yeah, they're all violent and they all raise you up to be crazy and all that stuff. Like guns kill. Yeah. What, but what do those have in common? They're all fighting. Yeah. Contact sports. Yeah. So what I'm looking for in respect to this. They're not categories, but what are they divided up into? Anybody that's ever been a wrestler should know this. You have to go around dang old trash bag, dang old run around the school 50 million times. Weight classes, exactly. And that's your difference between qualitative and what? Quantitative. Okay. Michaela, were you in the were you in the wrestling were you in the wrestling uh, gig in high school? <laughs> She's the first one that said weight classes. Okay, so qualitative. I was a photographer. Oh, that's great. Now that's something. Photography is something that that's that's that's. That's wild. Some of the things people can do with photography. I'm not talking about Photoshop. I'm talking about the way that people can take pictures of certain things. That's really wild. Uh, anyway, anything that can go in classes is qualitative, quantitative. Anything that goes in categories is quantitative. Think of this. Would shoe size be quali quantitative or qualitative? Well, you could put it in, do you put it in blondes, brunettes, and redheads? No. You would put it in the quant, uh, quantitative. Good, Mr. Howard. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Miss Howard and Mr. Yates. They came up at the same time. Sorry. All right. So that's the difference between qualitative data and quantitative data. Quantitative goes in classes meaning numbers, categories, or qualitative, which means characteristics or categorical, if you like to sound impressive. Or you can just regurgitate this like the guy, like the Michael Bolton clone in uh, A Beautiful Mind, or not A Beautiful Mind, uh, Good Will Hunting. It's two of my favorite movies. Good Will Hunting and Beautiful Mind. Love those movies. All right. In the ba scene, B A A H, ba, the ba, the Harvard ba. Nationality would be qualitative. Number of children, quantitative. Household income, class. Level of education, category. Daily intake of whole grains, class. Those are all test questions, A, B, C, D, and E. Uh, those are, each one of those could be a test question. In fact, I think you've got a couple on the test that are these, discrete and continuous, and you've got a couple that are qualitative and quantitative. 
Now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna I'm not gonna write all that. We're gonna go back to the handy dandy. I don't even know why I use slides. We're gonna go back to the handy dandy. I hope this dish rag is that gum clean. Looks like it's clean. Dang old French fry on the daggum whiteboard. All right. So discrete. And this is all there is to it, people. Please don't make this out to be difficult because y'all miss these on the test. There's two questions I can give y'all on the test, and y'all miss both of them, and I don't know why. Discrete means that you can what? Count. Continuous means you what? You measure. I want y'all to type in right now examples of something you measure. Good, Mr. King, you did get that right. I mean, you do measure. I want you to name something right now that you measure. And you're gonna see what they have to do with. Write down something in the in the chat that you measure. Now I want everybody to look at the answers. Good job, Miss Smith. Good job. I was wanting somebody to bring that one up. What else? That ain't it. But do you see do you see a pattern? Height, weight, length. Okay, let me give you an example why. I'm talking to the females in the group. Because males they don't care. Females, how many times? Do you weigh yourself at your house and then you go to the doctor's office and the scale at the doctor's office weighs 10 pounds more than you do at or weighs you 10 pounds more than the scale at your house? How many times does that happen to you? Oh, it doesn't happen to me. Oh, yeah, whatever. Why? Every time, as Billy said, every time. Why? Because measuring is not discrete. Measuring, you can't hold down to a certain number. You may get on one scale at Target, and that one scale may measure you at 110 pounds. You may get on the same right beside that, that scale and pick the black one instead of the white one. You, you stood on the white one. Now you stand on the black one, same scale, same, same set at zero, but it measures you a quarter of a pound more or less okay when you have to put in this right here what does that mean more or what less when you have to put this in that refers to continuous so write that down one thing that y'all didn't do y'all didn't say what, what's right there with volume What's right? What's what's next to volume? Mass, good. Area, there you go. Area. How about when you're painting a wall? Two people could measure that wall and come up with a different surface area, depending on how you're rounding. If you're rounding to the nearest foot, if you're rounding to the nearest inch, half inch, or whatever. And then you got people don't even know how to read a tape measure. So they just round off to the nearest foot, okay? The whole point is anything that has a plus or minus, meaning continuous, meaning, I'm sorry, meaning give or take, that means it is continuous. How many eggs are in a dozen eggs? I'm asking you all that. Is anybody answering anything but 12? Exactly. Why isn't anybody saying 13? Because a dozen eggs, and if you go to the grocery store and you pick up a carton of eggs that's a dozen, how many is going to be in that dozen? 12 every single time. Now, what if you measure the volume in a gallon of milk versus the name brand gallon of milk? Is it going to be the exact same? Yes or no?
I'm waiting for y'all to answer yes or no. They're not. You may be two or three drops different. It may be a milligram different. It may be uh, ounce different. But if you take two gallons of milk and you've got a weights and measures uh, apparatus that is perfect to the three to the thirty thousandth of an ounce, and you pour every bit of the milk in this jug, and you pour every bit of the milk in this jug, you will not come up with the same number. You may come off a half an ounce difference. You may come off a quarter of an ounce difference, but it's not going to be the same unless it's a real coincidence. Two good test questions. I give you three to four test questions. One is qualitative versus quantitative. The other one is discrete versus continuous. And people miss them. I don't know why they miss them, but they miss them. All right. Here's some examples. Number of children. When you see the word number, that's a dead giveaway. Number goes with discrete. Measure goes with continuous. Household income in the previous year. That's something measured. Daily intake of whole grains. Continuous, that's measured. Three good test questions right there. We already talked about all four of those. Now, you want to confuse somebody. Is time discreet? Why is it continuous? All right. Because how many times have you met somebody and they're not there? And their clock says the same time as your clock, but it's about a minute or two off. At eight o'clock, you were there, but you, they pull up and their clock says eight o'clock. Now, this is less, it's less continuous because of what do we carry? What do we carry now? Let me turn on my, I don't see y'all. What do we carry now? Exactly, Mr. King. We carry phones now. We carry phones. And um, Miss Billy, I'm going to look at my phone right now. And my phone says it's 114. What does yours say, Miss Billy? Well, somebody, okay, 114. See, could you argue that time is getting more and more discreet with our phones? Yes. Now, you take our phones out, then it's back to continuous. Unless you're dealing with people that have the same computer screen or, you know, work in the same office building. But what they're thinking about is continuous is you using your watch and you meet somebody at eight o'clock at Fuddruckers and you've been there for three minutes, they pull up and show you their watch and their watch says eight o'clock and your watch says 803 now. Okay, that's why time can be, to actually time could be both. Okay, so you got to be careful when you see a question on a test. I could ask a question on a test and say, you both have cell phones and you both are with the same network and you show up at the place at different times. You know, would that be continuous or would that be, that would be, that would be discreet because you have the phones with the same carrier. You're going to have discreet time right there. But they haven't factored that into the question. So right now, Anytime you see a question on time, it is usually continuous. So you might want to write that down. 
What did you learn you, Mr. Yates? What did you learn? You can talk. I'm always anxious to see when somebody's learned something new. About like the two different brands and like the gallon of milk. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, um, you can you could do an experiment, but but the but the way that you do that experiment, you'd have to have something that is marked and very accurate. You would have to mark it's like you'd have to have a graduated cylinder that measured well, I hate to say, I hate to use this, but like a quart or a pint, and then you go to the liquor store and you buy two uh, pints of liquor and you pour it in that and it's got a very graduated, you're going to see that one. Now, there are cases to where manufacturers put computers on their distributors and the, the bottles are basically almost the same. But if you really get down to basics, to the milliliter or to the, I don't know what's less than an ounce, a teaspoon, if you get less, than, there's going to be a difference. Okay, because it's measured. All right. So next. Go ahead and write down nominal. And I'm going to let you write this down. Uh, nominal is the umbrella. All data is nominal. Uh, ordinal, write down order. You don't need to write all that down, you just write down order. Nominal is an umbrella, and it usually encompasses all measurements. Your test scores could be nominal. If you put them in ordinal, they become ordinal. If you put them in order, if you put your test scores in order, then they become ordinal over nominal. I'll give you all a second or two. You don't have to write all this down for ordinal. The only thing you have to write down for ordinal is order. A good example, NASCAR. I had a NASCAR race this weekend at Darlington. Gonna have one Wednesday at 7.30. Okay, what's the, is it nominal or ordinal? At the end of the race, it's ordinal. Well, it's an ordinal because uh, you, 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 you know, if you speak to, uh, I can't think of his name. That gum took Dale Earnhardt's place. Can't think of his name. Just left me. Harvick. Kevin Harvick. If you talk to Kevin Harvick, it was ordinal because he was number one the whole time. But if you talk to somebody, Billy No Name, he don't want to talk about an ordinal because he's 43rd. But it's ordinal because what? <coughs> You're in the race, and at the end of the race, what are you in that race? You're part of an order. So Chase Elliott. Chase Elliott didn't. But I like Chase Elliott. I mean, the dang old Bill from Dawsonville. The only one I don't like is the one that thinks he's the greatest of all time. That's Kyle Bush. He ain't Jack. One thing you got to learn about respect. Respect is earned, not what? It's not given. You don't get respect just because you want it, Kyle. I'm sorry. Shut up, Hubert. Interval. A value of zero in the interval does not mean the absence of quantity. Temperature. Write down temperature for interval. First, you write down zero does not mean absence. Interval, zero, does not equal absence. A value of zero in ratio does mean absence. That'd be like dang old birthday. Dang old, you can't say you're negative three hours old. I mean, 
you could, I'm sorry, you could, because that's three hours before you came into the world. When you came into the world, that's zero. Does everybody understand that? Anything be before that technically is negative because you haven't come into the world yet. I like to think of ratio as dang old birthday, but that's just me. They'll give you some examples here in a second. There it is. Number of snack or soft drinks in a vending machine. Ratio. Why? Because if there's zero snack or soft drinks in the vending machine, what does that mean? It's freaking empty. Whether or not school is closed, that's nominal. True or false is usually nominal. Whether or not, yes or no, that's usually nominal. These are good test questions. Class rank, that's ordinal. You know that. Dang old 386 out of 388. Dang old. Dang old. I'm not going to talk about that. Number of days per week a student eats school lunch. That's poor old Horatio. Okay. Now that may be a standardized test question. I usually don't. I usually don't ask too many nominal or too many. I don't usually ask those questions too much. I usually ask uh, the qu quantitative, qualitative, discrete, continuous, statistic, sample, statistic, pop population and parameter. I usually ask those, but standardized, you may see one of these. What is an experiment and an observation? Well, that's pretty simple. An observation is when you just stare at people, dang old, dang old perv, dang old staring at people. You dang old stare at people sleeping. That would be an observation. You watch people sleeping and you, every time they snore, you put a cattle prod to them with electricity or a taser, that would be an experiment. Okay. People watching, exactly. That would be observing. There's actually jobs with DOT where you go out and observe and you count how many cars go over a bridge in an hour? That would be an observation. An observational study. An experiment would be putting a sign at the beginning of the bridge that says bridge may fall when you drive over it. That would be an experiment. When you put input or control into a observation, it becomes an experiment. Researchers, I've, I've never read this before. Researchers wanted to investigate cancer risk among Danish cellular phone users who were followed for up to 21 years. To do so, they kept track of blah, 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 blah who had brain tumor and compared. Did they do anything to control or affect this? Yes or no? They didn't do anything. They just recorded numbers. So that means this is an observation. Okay. Okay, did they not? Did they say whether that was an observation or a... Okay, there we go. In both studies, the goal of the research, I, I thought they were going to just give us one example, I'm sorry. In both the studies, the research, radio, blah, 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 whether or not the brain, blah, 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 blah. Okay, they didn't. Okay, they didn't say whether it was an observational study. I, I looked like an observational study. Um, 
whether or not, and write this down, whether or not a brain cancer was contracted is the response variable. Write that down, because you're going to have some homework questions about that. The level of cell phone usage is the explanatory variable. Now, I'm going to give you something that you could relate to here. The explanatory variable is the independent variable. The level of cell phone usage is going to come before the brain cancer, right? In other words, if you don't have a cell phone, then there's absolutely no chance of you having brain cancer by a cell phone. Do you see what I'm saying? If you don't have a cell phone, you're not going to have this brain cancer they're talking about. So the cell phone is the independent. The dependent variable is the brain cancer. That depends on the cell phone usage. So write that down. Your independent variable is your exploit. It's what causes it. This is the symptom. Very important that you understand that for standardized test question and homework questions. The response variable is the effect. The explanatory variable is the cause. Make sure you understand that. Everybody good? Hopefully you understand that. Observational study, blah, 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 blah. That's just. That's not a test question, so I'm not going to work. Observational versus experiment, that's a test question. And homework question and standardized test question is the explanatory, which is your independent, versus your response, which is your dependent. Go ahead and write these two down because these are uh, standardized questions and homework questions. Compounding in a study occurs when the effects of two or more explanatory variables, explanatory is calls, are not separated. Therefore, any relation that may exist between an explanatory variable and the response variable may be due to some other variable or variables not accounted for. For instance, if I tell you that the, the correlation of death by drowning and death by Rocky Mountain spotted fever are the same curve, is there something that's causing both of them? Think about that. Somebody tell me, is there something causing an uprise in drownings in Rocky Mountain spotted fever? Yes. To get both of them, you got to be outside. So that means high temperatures, which is a lurking variable. A lurking variable is an exploratory variable that was not considered in the study but affects the value of the response. Lurking, dang old perv, dang old, dang old trench coat behind the bushes, okay? Lurking would be hot weather makes more people get what? Get out, and if they get out, they go swimming. The more swimming, the more drowning. The more people that go hiking, the more people that get ticks. Versus dang old December. Uh, you think there's going to be a high rise in drownings and Rocky Mountain spotted fever in December in South Carolina? No. Or January, because we don't usually have our cold month until January and February. So the, the hot weather or the cold weather would be a lurking variable. Some lurking variables in the influenza study, age, health status, or mobility of senior, of the senior. So those are lurking variables. What's the lurking variable in the pandemic? Senior citizens. 
That's the lurking variable. Probably because it was the the uh, virus was created by a nation that believes in population control. I'm sorry. Even after accounting for potential lurking variables, the authors of the study concluded that getting an influenza shot is associated with lower risk of being hospitalized from dying from influenza. Which we ain't got to worry about influenza. It just went away. Flu just went away. We don't have any more flu. All we got now is coronavirus. No more flu, just corona. I'm being sarcastic. Uh, a compounding variable of an explanatory variable that was considered in a study is not in fact distinguished from a secondary explanatory variable in the study. I'm not going to worry about that. I don't think that's either on test or no, I don't think. Um, they, they give you the definition of a compound variable and an explanatory variable that is an explanatory variable. Explanatory means that it, it's a cause that was considered in a study whose effect cannot be distinguished from a second explanatory variable. So that would be if you had two things going on uh, with the deaths of drowning and you had two things and you couldn't make sure one of them that would be like like um uh, i don't know uh i'm trying to think okay unemployment and weather being hot okay if people are not employed that means that you're just sitting around the what? They're just sitting around the house. And of course, in summertime, they're not going to sit around the house. They're going to go out and do something. Okay. So that might be, you know, that might be a compounding variable. You can't prove which one is causing the high rates of, because there's two, and they could both be, or one be affecting more than the other. That's a compounding. Because what does compounding sound like? It sounds like confusion. Compounding, confusion. So think of it like that. I'm not going to do too many cross set. I'm not going to go into this. You can write this down. A cross sectional, uh, a specific point in time or over a very short period. In 1918, what was going on in the United States? 1918, we had a pandemic. That's a cross-sectional study. Case control, retrospective. Okay. Look back in time. Over the last 10 years, what was the DUI rate in South Carolina? Look over the last 10 years, that's retrospective. Now, the difference between retrospective and cross-sectional is cross-sectional is one point in time or between 1918 and 1920. Whereas these studies, the retrospective studies are done over a long period, longer period of time. Cohort identifies a group of individuals to participate in the study. So that could be over a long period of time or a short period of time, but people are picked. Okay, let's say that I choose Anderson campus to go through a study of how many people were in the Marlboro Club over the over the time of two semesters. Okay, I picked Anderson campus. So that would be a cohort. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these these uh, because as long as you know the difference between them on a standardized test, you you know them. I'm not going to census. Go ahead and write census down because census is very important uh, for you on a standardized test. But everybody in the room should know what a census is, especially now because I did mine the other day. Hopefully you've done yours. Um, it only takes you a few minutes to do it over the phone over the computer. It took me about 
five minutes. They tell what kind of person I was. I said, they ain't no, they ain't no American. They asked me what, what origin was I? I said, American. I don't have an origin. I'm an American. I probably pissed them off. Miss Billy, you born in America, you're American. That's just what I think. Mr. Yates, you born in America, you American. That's what I, I mean, I don't know what y'all think, but I think if you're born in America, you're American. Obtain a simple random sample. Okay, a random sample. Anybody know what a random sample is? A random sample, only, you only need two or three words. Each has same opportunity. Write that down. Each has same opportunity. That's what that means. Is random sample the one you want to go with? Hail to the yes. The next, to, the next to the best of random sample is a simple random sample, which is a group. Let's say if I took, okay, I'm going to pull this on the board right quick. Hold on, let me move. Everybody see my board right here or am I, hold on. Okay, there we go. What? I'm getting irritated. How did I do this? Am I in the same class? I must have hit something. There we go. Sorry about that. See if I can get back to the am I back to the meeting. There we go. All right. Does everybody see these nine icons right here? All right. Let's say that these are the only people in the room. Okay, these nine people right here. Yates, Billy, Herring, Howard King, Flores, Espinosa, Osario. Sprouse and I can't get rid of the bar. There we go. And I can't see it. Is that Miss Smith? Yeah, Miss Smith. Okay, so I got nine people in the class and I'm trying to get rid of the bar and I can't get rid of it. I'm clicking, but when I click, it's supposed to go away. There we go. Um, a random sample would be each one of these people put their name and it comes back. Each, each person put their name on a post-it note and put the post-it note in a goldfish bowl and there'll be nine post-it notes and I pick one. Write that down. That is a random sample because each nine person, people, have the same what of being picked. Now, the difference between a random sample and a simple random sample is I'm going to call this group Mr. Yates. Uh, I'm trying to get my bar back now. This is slowly pissing me off. I'm supposed to put the names. There we go. Mr. Yates, Howard, and it goes away. Osario, I'm going to call them Group A. And I'm going to put Group A on a piece of paper and fold it. And then I'll take Billy King and Sprouse, and that's going to be Group P. And I'm going to put Group B on a piece of paper, and I'm going to put it in the goldfish bowl. And then Herring, Flores, Espinosa, Espinosa and Miss Smith, that's going to be Group C. And I'm going to put three pieces of paper in a bowl, and one's going to be called Group A, one's going to be called Group B, and one's going to be called Group C. And I pick one of those pieces of paper. That is a simple random sample. Everybody with me? Okay. 
So why did I tell you that? Because a random sample, a simple random sample, and a systematic random sample are the three best samples. Write that down. A random sample, a simple random sample, and a systematic random sample are your best samples because everyone has the same chance of being picked. Now, a systematic sample is well, I'm, they're going through and tell you that. Why don't they do system systematic next? There, a systematic is obtained by selecting every blank individual from a population. Systematic, put down in notebook, put down in your notebook, every hundredth person in the phone book. Or let's make it easy. Every last person on the front page, on each page of the phone book. So you turn the first page, you pick that person. You turn the next page, you pick that person. You turn the next page, you pick that person in the bottom right hand corner. <coughs> that would be systematic. All right, in this class of nine people, I picked every third person. And that would be Mr. Osirio, Ms. Sprouse, and Smith, Ms. Smith. So I picked every third person. That's a systematic. Those are your three most accurate, best samples to take. Now, here's an example of a systematic. A quality control engineer wants to obtain a systematic sample of 25 bottles coming off a filling machine to verify the machine is working properly. Design a sampling technique that could be used. I'd pick every fifth bottle. Every fifth bottle I would pick and measure the contents. That's what I would do. Let's go back to Stratified. Usually they put systematic after, and then they put Stratified and Cluster. I don't know why they decided to change it. Okay, a Stratified sample is obtained by separating the population into non-overlapping groups called strata. And then obtaining a simple random sample from each strata. What if I broke the class up into male and female? Would there be any overlaps? Lord, I hope not. Okay, male and female. There would be no overlaps. Okay. What if I go to a voting precinct and I go in there and I say, you know, lock the door and I say, right quick, I'm going to do a 10 minute study. I need everybody to break up into Democrat and Republican. And everybody did it and answered the question, that's stratified. I went into a group and I broke it up into two non-overlapping, and you can break it up into many, many strata if you want to. I could break it into Democrat, Republican, Independent. Democrat, Republican, Other, Independent. Independent and Other. So I would have four strata, strata. Strata is plural. Strata is plural. Stratum is singular. And then you got cluster. All individuals within a randomly selected collection or group of individuals. A good example here would be a voting precinct. Ask everybody in the voting precinct when they come out an exit poll. Ask everybody who they voted for, Smith or Jones. That would be a cluster sample because I'm not dividing it up into any group. I'm just asking everybody. A cluster sample would be like a voting precinct. Question, right, complaint. Okay. Now, the least accurate 
would be a convenience sample. Write that down. This is your test question slash standardized test question. They will put a convenient sample or a random sample on there, I guarantee you. They might not put the middle ones, but they'll put random and they'll put convenient. Let me give you an example of a convenient sample. Let's say I worked at WROQ, it used to be Rock 101 in Anderson, I don't still is still that way, but anyway, WROQ 101 in Anderson, and I play nothing but 80s metal music. 80s, 80s music. And let's say I'm going to school at that time, and I'm taking a statistics course, and I need to do a survey, and I do a survey, and I just I just stopped the record and I holler out to people. I said, I need the next hundred people to call me and tell me what kind of music do you like? Somebody tell me right quick, what's wrong with that? And the, uh, somebody type it in the conversation. What's wrong with that sample? Why, what, what, what's wrong? It's biased, why? Because I am a DJ at a what? At a rock radio station. Everybody that calls in is going to, that listens to my show is going to like rock music. Exactly. That's why a convenient sample is usually not a good sample. Let's say you live in an apartment complex right beside the sidewalk. And you holler out to people, hey, do you really care about your health? Well, what is that person doing that's walking on the sidewalk? They're walking. Now, either one of two things, either they're walking to a destination or they're walking to stay in shape. So chances are most of the people that are walking are going to say, yes, I care about my health. That's why a convenience sample is usually not very substantial. Results should be looked upon with extreme skepticism. And I'm not going through this. Uh, you can read it. Bias. Here's the word of the day, bias. I think Miss uh, Mr. Yates said it. I thought somebody else did. Okay, they said it in different words, but basically bias. What is bias? Bias is basically when you use, you're not neutral. Bias is when you're not neutral. Whether it's a question, whether it's collecting, or whether it's calculating you could be biased in saying, well, you know, this guy says that he, he doesn't agree with, that. that means he don't like them, you know. Okay, that's bias. He says he didn't agree with him. He didn't say he didn't like him. He said, I don't agree with him. That doesn't mean the same as I don't like him. How many of you have gotten a fight or an argument with your spouse or mate or significant other? Does that mean you hate them? It means you don't like them? No, it means that you just disagree. So bias is when you are not neutral. Not neutral means that you're weighing a certain way. Can somebody give me two examples of someone who is not biased? And if you put C and N down, I'm just going to go ahead and cut off everything and leave. I'm not even going to say that. Okay? But give me two examples of a, I guess you would call it an occupation that should not be biased. Don't need all of them.
Good. I wouldn't say an attorney because an attorney wants you to be innocent. Okay. Um, you're close with an attorney. Think of something. There we go. Judge. Scientist, good. One more. Except if you're a Clemson fan. Because if you're a Clemson fan and if Clemson loses, whose fault is it? Go ahead and put it down. I know we got Clemson fan. Whose fault is it if Clemson loses? Nobody's going to say it. No, it's not the other team. Oh, hell no. If Clemson loses, it's always not the coach. Oh, no. Oh, God, no. You don't blame you don't blame Dabo for nothing. He's he I mean he's the second to walking on water. Who who did, who does Clemson fans blame when Clemson loses? Everybody but Clemson, you're right there. They blame the referees. Okay? A true Clemson fanatic, I'm not talking about just somebody that supports him. A true Clemson fanatic, the ones that'll fight you over something stupid. They, they're the ones that say, oh, well, that, that, they'll get on Facebook. These referees are terrible. Whatever. A referee is only as good as his eyesight, and sometimes the eyesight is not that good. And I'll tell you something. I sit, I sit on a land use board, and I'm the chairman, and there's been many times where I've had to put things to the side and say, and we as a committee you know, there's one time, I'll, I'll, I'll use this as an example. There was this guy one time, and he had point seven, no, point six eight eight acres, okay, which is a little bit over half an acre. And the, 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 and he couldn't use it because you have to have point seven five acres in Anderson County to put a septic tank on a piece of property. He had 0.68 and he needed to have 0.75. Well, it came up before the board. There's seven of us on this board and we heard from about 20 people said all they did was all he, he's going to do is put a mobile home on it. That's all he wants to do is put a mobile home on it. And they did their little spiel and then he got up and said, I just want to use the property. I don't want it just to sit there. I want to use it for something. And I got, I finally, we finally listened to both sides. And I told, I, I said, first of all, I want to say something to the people that are here. Our job is not to determine what he puts on that property. He could put a strip club on that property. He could put a mobile home. I said, I lived in a mobile home for 12 years of my life. I said, that's not our concern. Our concern is setting a precedent for people that has less than 0.75 acres to put a septic tank on a piece of property. If we do that now, then we're going to open up Pandora's box and everybody's going to be putting septic tanks on, on less than 0.75. I said, we could care less what he puts on that piece of property. That is being non-biased. That's being down the center. Okay. You've got to be, when you're in a stat statistician or probability office when you are in quality control you've got to be non-biased you can't say oh we don't like this guy so we're going to do whatever we can to make to mess him up or i don't like this guy he so i'm gonna vote against this because he's probably gonna put a trailer on there you can't do that if you're hired or you're asked to be in a non-biased position meaning a judge a referee a chairman of whatever committee you have to, or scientists, you can't say, well, that's not the way I want it to come out, so I'm going to fiddle the numbers and I'm going to fix it to where people in Hades want ice water, okay? I like things to come out the way I want them to all the time, but it doesn't work that way, okay? Basically, like you said, the rules apply to everyone. In other words, if a judge, judge and right now we've got, I've got stories of judges. Some judges are not down the middle. Some are political, and that's not right, okay? But you have to look out for it. You can't just take what you're given because knowledge is what? Knowledge is power. The more you know, the better off you are. 
just like bias. You need to be able to sniff it out, whether it's in a scientific setting, like you said, uh, Ms. Mr. Sprouse, or a judge. You need to be able, if you're in a courtroom and you're covering a, a court that is in session or you're a part of a court case, you need to watch for that kind of thing. If a, if a, if a judge says, uh, if a judge says, uh, well, I don't want to hear from you because I don't like you. Okay. That's bias. Or if, if a chairman says, well, Mr. Smith, I, we're going to vote you down because you don't need to be putting the mobile home on there. That's bias. You, you cannot do that because that's not your job. And when you're in a statistics type setting, you cannot dictate the outcome just because it's what you want. Because like I say, people in Haiti want ice water. Sampling bias means that the technique you used is tends to favor. So, you know, I could pull my sample from, we got a place called Concrete up in the northern part of the county. Most of them are Republican. So if I go up to a sample of bias and I just pick people from concrete, I know it's going to be more conservative. Under coverage. Well, I don't want I don't want to get too many people to go against what I'm trying to get. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna survey 10 people. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. Non-response bias. Um, individuals selected to be in a sample who do not respond have different opinions from those who do. Non-response can be improved through the use of callbacks. Okay. Some people would say, okay, these people didn't respond, so we're just going to do the ones that did respond. We're not going to make phone calls and try to get them to respond. No. If you survey 100 people, then you need to get 100 feedbacks back. You don't stop at 50 and say, oh, well, the others didn't return. We're just going to go ahead and do with these 50. No, that ain't the way it works. Response bias. Response bias can be in the question or it can be in the answer. These are not test questions. They may be standardized test questions. I will ask you about bias, but I'm not going to ask you about all these different biases. Um, response bias exists when answers on a survey do not reflect the true feeling of the, of the respondent. And that could be, um, how many of, why do you have to have a lawyer present when you are convicted of a crime or, you know, why, why would you want to have a lawyer present? And y'all can open up your mics at this point because we're about, we're about on the last half of the class. Why would you want a lawyer present? So you don't say anything to convict yourself. You're right, Mr. Yates. Okay. Look what happened to Flynn, General Flynn. Uh, basically, uh, he was put in a position to where his son was going to be, they were going to start investigating his son and all this other stuff. And he said, look, just leave my son alone. I'll just say I'm guilty. Okay. In a lot of those interviews, his lawyer was not present. And you never, ever, unless you're totally 100% innocent, and you know you got a camera back there at Domino's that'll show that you're innocent, or you got a camera in Publix that shows that you were in there when the crime was being done, if you know that you're innocent, then you don't need a lawyer. But in most cases, you always want to have a lawyer present because you could say, I went to the office at 9 a.m. And then later it turns out that you went at 8.30. The police can convict you of lying because you said 9 o'clock. Okay? That same thing, same thing here. You've got to make sure you put out good questions, not leading questions. You can't say, you can't start a question. Uh, tell me the reason you don't like John Smith. That's wrong. You do not ask a question 
why you do not like John Smith? That is a biased question, a biased response. Tell me your thoughts about John Smith. Negative thoughts, less than negative thoughts, other. There's no, there's no positive there. It's all negative. Okay. Hopefully you can see now. Can somebody give me any examples of maybe something that's biased? The news. I'm sorry. What? The news. Oh my gosh. How dare you, Miss Billy? Oh, Mr. King, how dare you? No, the news is not biased. It's neutral. <clears throat> but besides the news, can somebody give me something else that may be biased? <coughs> Somebody said scientist a while ago. I think Mr. Sprouse, I think you said science. A scientist could be biased. Um, I'm trying to think of one, but I can't think of one right now. But there are, you know, scientists that can be biased. Anybody else got a, a head coach for their team? Yes. Uh, how about a coach that has a son for a quarterback? You know, uh, how about that? Oh, God. And I, and I pulled for South Carolina, but oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. What was that kid's name this year? Oh, gosh. What was his name? He was terrible. Uh, yeah, go Gamecock. Who was the Gamecocks? I believe the offensive coordinator was his dad. No, before Helensky. It was the guy that, oh, God, he was terrible. Bentley, that's him. Yeah. Well, Bentley was, that was that was an extreme bias coach right there. Um, yeah. That, yeah. So a coach could be biased. How about something else? News, a scientist, a coach, anything else? How many of you have ever sat in a uh college course or a high school course and the teacher told you you're wrong for an opinionated answer. Anybody? And that's called bias and indoctrination. Okay. If you're given an open answer, if I ask Mr. Yates, Mr. Yates, why do you think the sky's blue? And he goes, well, the sky is blue because the spectrum of light is hitting and everybody sees that spectrum in the spectrum of blue. No, you're wrong, Mr. Yates. You're racist. That's bias, okay? You can't, you can't, you can't do that, okay? You can't, uh, and you can't ask an open, a uh, car dealers, yeah. Car dealers are like, ooh, car dealers, mm, stay away from car dealers. Uh, you can't, you can't, ask an open question in a classroom and say that you're wrong. Uh, this happened, I was, in a, I was in a math class last semester or two semesters ago, and I walked in on an economics class. And the economics class, they were asking the difference between socialism and capitalism. And the teacher asked, why do you like capitalism? And one of the students said, I like capitalism because it keeps it, it, it keeps a good part of the government out of the, the market and the market can grow and you can grow. And the teacher said, no, you're wrong. And I looked at that teacher. Of course, the teacher was at another campus because it was being Skyped in. And I looked at that teacher. I mean, I looked and I went, oh, my gosh, I got to get out of here uh, because that teacher was trying to promote socialism and that teacher was trying to say that socialism was greater than that's not what she asked the teacher asked what is your thoughts on capitalism versus socialism that's that's her exact her thought thoughts and you don't take somebody's thoughts and say that they're wrong that's called indoctrination okay I'm sorry. I, I got that's a that's a nerve with me. Bias is a nerve with me. I try to I try to be right down the middle, but you know sometimes I could be biased. I don't know. I make fun of a lot of stuff, but it's usually being I'm usually sarcastic. 
I never sit there and I never ask opinionated questions and tell you you're wrong. Okay? Data entry, that could be on purpose or it could be uh, by mistake. Most of the time, data entry is usually by mistake. Unless you've got somebody that's really, you'd have to be really biased to make mistakes on purpose. And I'm not going to go into sampling errors. Do we go through 1.6, Miss Billy? Do you have somebody have their outline out? I don't have my outline. Somebody type in if we go to 1.6. Or, or please tell me we don't go to 1.5 and 1.6. I've already gone over that. Do we go to 1.6? We don't. Okay. So I think that's a good place to stop. So we made it through chapter one, right? Is that what you're saying? You don't turn your microphones on now. So we made it through chapter one. Yes, sir. Okay. So what y'all need to do now is work on chapter one homework. Go ahead and read chapter two. That means Thursday we won't have class because y'all read y'all's email, right? Yes. So yes, I will yes, put a video up linking y'all to 2.1. What Miss somebody tell me? Do we go to 2.4? Look on the outline. 2.3? You probably need to reboot your computer or something. I think you're either your 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 wireless or your computer is is skipping. Um, so I will put a video up on 2.1 through 2.3 for Thursday. So y'all have Thursday off. And I will see y'all Tuesday of next week. Am I right? Quick. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit the record unrecord button and then I'm gonna take roll one last time. Stop recording. <laughs>